Yeah, remember the name. Jazz tech all best in the game. Mob and mentality in his own lane. So better pay attention to what he be saying. Get the message, ain't no question. Giving advice for any investment. Welcome to the broadcast, the Jazz Tack All Podcast. I'm gonna talk to you about a lot of different things. Um, but I am so stoked for today's episode uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one is because uh, we have a live audience. Mm -hmm. And um, I do a program for for realtors where I bring in um, a, a group of realtors right across you know our city and province. It's in person. It's a 10 day uh, event that I do three hours a day. And I was just talking to them. It's called the immersion program where they come in and kind of immerse themselves into, into my world, really into my business and my team's business. And I was talking to them yesterday. It was day one. Um, and I had, uh, I bring in a guest speaker for day one um, who, who really is an expert when it comes to the real estate market. And I was telling them, I was like, for me, as my viewers and listeners know, that I don't have anything really past a high school education and even that i barely passed right sure. um i think they just wanted me out of the school so they kind of gave <laughs> yeah, me my passing grades um and so when i got into real estate i needed to look for to people to get my education and get my information so i can i can articulate well to my clients and and as i started looking around there's not a lot of people um, that are really true, true experts. And now being in the business coming up to 19 years, I rely on three to four people. The gentleman that I had come speak, he's my broker of record yesterday, uh, uh, Christopher Slido, my viewers and listen listeners have seen him on, on, on past podcasts. But you are someone, and I'm not just blowing smoke up your ass, brother. You are someone that I, I creep on socials, not because I think you're just good looking <laughs> yeah, or anything yeah, of that sort yeah. and, and, and how you do your content, but man, the, the amount of information that you have in that head of yours when it comes to not only Southern Ontario real estate market, which is important to my viewers and listeners, sure. but the Canadian real estate market, I actually think you are the top and like big kudos to your your and i'm not sure if jg is a business partner and all that we'll get into that stuff but mm -hmm. your organization rain mm -hmm. is hands down and i'm part of a couple of investment groups sure large investment groups but i think what you guys do best at rain is the amount of data that you put out there yeah. and for possible investors which is makes up probably 75 to 80 percent of my viewership and listenership when you have a lot of data, you can make better informed decisions. 100%. And Patrick, Mr. Patrick Francie, you're the guy who kind of leads all that. So first and foremost, thank you. Cause you and I've been doing this, trying to get you on the podcast for a while. <laughs> yeah. And I told you the last time I was on your podcast, I said, yeah. man, I don't want to do it virtual with you. Yeah, and yeah. I really, and you said, ah, jazz, I'll make it happen when I come. You know, a lot of people say that, but you did. You oh, said, yeah. I'm flying in. Yeah. You're here for a day. Yeah. And you came to my studio. 100%. And I can't tell you how much that means to me. I have goosebumps. I'm not sure if the camera's going to catch it or not. It really means a lot because I learned so much from you. That's and great. I'm able to now educate not only my 11,362 people in my community as investors, but other real estate agents, which is a passion. So thank you for being on the podcast. Awesome. So happy to be here. Excited about a conversation, man. I, I'm really, really pumped. So, couple, and I want to take it everywhere, man. Like your investment group, yep. uh, 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 personal stuff as sure. well, um, and whatever you're comfortable sharing. Your Open book, man. I love that. I love that. Um, you know, a lot of people ask like why real estate, but my viewers and listeners, they know. Mm -hmm. They know why real estate is not necessarily the best, best investment in the world. That's my take on it. I'm not sure if it's the best investment in the world, but I definitely think it's one of. Yeah. But what I wanted to really get from you is how did you get into real estate? Mm -hmm. like what was it that was like, you know, this is how you got in as your first investment? Well, you know, it's interesting. It's not that complicated. You know, I've been a business owner for almost 40 years, you know, 39 years, I've owned a particular business in Edmonton, still own it to this what day. What business is that again? What's that? What business was that? Like? It's a retail business okay. called ProSkate. We're into a totally different industry, by the way. And uh, that's a whole different side life. But anyways, I still own that business today. Um, haven't had a key to the store for, gosh, 
15 years. Like, I don't think I can get in. The, uh, no, I can't get in the store on my own. I have to phone somebody. Not that I want to. But the point is, I've owned that store many years. <clears throat> had two stores. Had to make the tough call. Shut one location down uh, through COVID. And so I did that. Uh, having said that, still own that store today. But back in the time when I was really building that business, you know, I was really paying attention to other business owners. You know, entrepreneurship was my game, not real estate at all. It wasn't even, I didn't know how to spell real estate. And I joke about it, but it's true. Yeah. You know, is it one word? Is it two words? Do I capitalize it? Like, I really don't know. Like, yeah, that's yeah. that's how distance it was. It's like pro forma for us. <laughs> we always have a tough time with Laura. Laura's here. Uh, uh, it's always, is it two words? Yeah, but continue. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so that was my world. And, and I looked at some very successful business guys that I admired. And, you know, regardless of how successful they were in business, I mean, some of them making multi, multi millions of dollars, every single one of them owned real estate. And, and I thought that, you know, isn't that interesting? And one day I happened to have a conversation and somebody said to me, and I was struggling with business. And that's the next phase of that was when this guy came in to buy me a lunch, business owner. He says, come on, let's go for lunch. I go, dude, I can't get out of here. There's no way. And I was frustrated and, and he sat down with me and I know it's cliche now, but it wasn't back then. And he looked right at me and he goes, I said, I'm just too busy. You know, like I can't get out of this business. And he goes, do you know something, Patrick? The day you start working on your business and stop working in your business is the day you'll be able to go for lunch. And it was like somebody hit me between the eyes with a hammer. Like so cliche these days, it seems like everybody knows that, but I didn't know it back then. That was 25 years ago. And so, I started looking and talking with him a little bit more and I saw that he was investing in real estate as well. And he said, you know, you have to think about how you're going to exit your business. I said, I don't know. I've never thought about that. And he goes, well, at some point you're going to want to sell your business and, or you're going to need to do something that makes sure that you have income in the future and real estate's the way to do that. So he kind of guided me along that path. And interestingly enough, I, Waited another couple of years before I even looked at real estate. This was back in the late 90s. Okay. And then in about 1998, oh my gosh, I'm aging myself, aren't I? You know, so anyways, 1998, I'm driving down the street. I see this open house, these condos in Edmonton. And uh, I walk in the door and I look at these condos that they've totally rebuilt. A project by Christensen Brothers, which was a big deal back then. And I walked in, I said to the realtor, I go, how much for these condos? And they were $57,000. And I went, well, that was a lot of money. I know. Right like back then, it was still all you can't rel- get a relative. Right? Spot in Toronto right now for $57,000. <laughs> like, well, exactly. You're a buck 25, a buck 30 for a parking spot today. Yeah. But how simple was it, you know, with no guidance? So I walk in, the realtor's holding an open house. I said, you know, could I possibly buy these units and then rent them out? And she looked at me and she goes, yeah, but. Like the tax consequences of that are just stupid. Okay. And I went, oh, okay. And I walked out the door and that was my that was my first and last step into the conversation of real estate. Okay. And it shut me down. I go, okay, well, she's an expert, I guess. I don't know what I thought. I wasn't thinking, obviously. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I walked away. So then it was two years later and I came across this little ad in the paper, learn about Alberta real estate, understand what's happening in this marketplace. It was an ad in a classified newspaper back then. And uh, I went to an event and there was a guy by the name of Tim Johnson, who was one of the original founders, who was actually the original founder of the Real Estate Investment Network. Okay. And he was hosting an event and it was an introduction event. And uh, I went to the next event that they were putting on and he, was, he talked about real estate. And he talked about real estate in a way that was like, oh, I, I can understand this concept. What the hell? Why aren't I investing kind in real estate? It down a little bit. Like well, he just, put in it was like a 90 this. minute presentation. Got it. You know, it was part of his sales funnel into what they had was an event called Acre, which was the authentic Canadian real estate program. Uh, back then they didn't call it Acre. They called it something else, which doesn't matter because I can't remember. But <laughs> ultimately it took me to a three day event, two and a half day event with the Real Estate Investment Network. And that's where I started investing in real estate. I got that weekend spent on the Real Estate Investing in Canada program, understanding the 15, well, it was only eight steps back then. <laughs> Anyways, the evolution of real estate. And uh, yeah, that's when I started investing in real estate. Has a lot changed from then in terms of what you're looking for when you're making an investment into real estate? Are, are, are the fundamentals the fundamentals? Well, understand that there's, when we talk about the fundamentals of investing in real estate, what most don't take into consideration is what we look at 
And that's where our brand is really built around is the economic fundamentals. Okay. So it wasn't just about the how to invest in real estate, you know, how to get a mortgage, how to decide on what property, how to do a pro forma. There was that part of it, but it was really understanding why you were investing in real estate. And then what were the economic fundamentals that was driving the region that you were interested in? In other words, we often have the conversation and it really is a conversation we have to this day is we want to invest in a region with an economic future, not an economic past. We want to look at where real estate is going less of where it's been less, you know, where it's been historically. I know as realtors, that's always something we're looking at is that historic, you know, history, but uh, the history really means nothing. It, it, it's good information. It's an indicator, but you still need to know where it's going. And what drives real estate is what's going on economically and understanding what's going on economically allows you to see the future of where real estate is going. And that's the fundamental difference with buying a home and investing in real estate. If you're buying a home, you're less concerned about it. You want to, of course, grow equity and it becomes this thing. And But it's not considered an investment. You're not buying it for cash flow. You're not buying it for appreciation per se. It's a place you want to live. And you're, you know, is it close to mom's house? You know? Exactly right. And then what are the kitchen cabinets look yeah. like and all that kind of stuff. Um, now, you said where, you know, when, when you were talking about where the market's heading in and trying to forecast, I'm thinking of Wayne Gretzky yeah, he always where wanted to go going. where the puck yeah. is going, right? Yeah. What are those metrics that you're looking for? Well, when you say economic like factors, what yeah. are those? So there's what we call the economic fundamentals, which are the the drivers, economic drivers, and then there's the influencers. There's two parts to that equation. So when we look at the fundamentals, we know that what drives housing is an economy, and you need economic conditions that would represent gross domestic product, GDP growth. So GDP growth is the economic health of a region. You know, how much productivity is going on. And when we see those positive GDP numbers, it represents jobs, right? And when you have positive GDP numbers and you have positive jobs, that means people are working. Good news. Then what it means is that if it's a strong job growth, then you're going to attract people coming into that region. So then you have population growth. And when you have population growth, growth, you have rental demand. And rental demand is driven because when people move into an area, unless they're very familiar with the area, you know, we look at Canada, you got immigration, interprovincial migration, people moving into an area, they rent. Mm -hmm. So we know that rental demand increases when there's good GDP growth, good job growth, people come into the region because they need to work, and then ultimately they rent. Historically, and by the numbers, the data supports that if you were to start at zero and all of a sudden GDP growth jumps to, let's say, 2%, 2.5%, and you say from that point, you go, okay, watch what's going to happen next. GDP means there's jobs. Jobs mean there's people going to move into the region. People moving into the region means they're going to rent. And about 18 months later, after they rent, they say, okay, I've rented enough. 18 months to two years, now they got a credit rating. Now they know that their job is solid. Now that they've got some money in the bank, they know where they want to work. If they're culturally you know, come immigrants from another country, they know where they want to live because they're going to move to where culturally they can connect with mm -hmm. their people mm -hmm. and speak the language and practice all the cultures that they, they do. That's why all my Paisans, my Indian Paisans, they move to Brampton and Surrey. Like, yeah, exactly. Just like go to those places. A hundred percent. Where all our people are. Well, and, and that's another interesting factor as an investor. But the point is, is that at that point they said, okay, well, they say, let's buy a home. And then the demand for homes start to go up, mm -hmm. and it's a simple supply-demand issue. Now, would you say, like, you're looking at transitory kind of areas where, like, from an age perspective, like, is there's, 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 there's younger people because you know that they're going to, they're going to rent at the start, and then if they start to buy, would they necessarily, like, they might leave that area. So is that a good factor, like a good metric you're looking at? Well, this becomes who is your client, who's your tenant? What is your tenant profile? So you talk about transitory. You can actually, if you know a city well and you understand the economics that are driving that particular city, in every city there's what we would call an area in transition. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's kind of the right on the edge of rough part of town. Yes. Right? Yep. But what happens as a city grows is that, you know, generally younger 
couples move into those areas because it's affordable, mm-hmm. right? Well, they don't necessarily want to, but that's what is affordable. Then the next thing you know, they set up house, they have kids, and then guess what? You know, there's no riffraff in my backyard, you know? Right. There's, there's, you know, all of a sudden Mama Bear starts kicking all the riffraff off the street. They start cleaning up that street. Well, the next thing you know, the edge of that is moved, Right. So those are areas in transition. As an investor, those are great if you know the area, but you have to understand that there's generally could be two, three, five years of transition that could be a little painful. Okay. So I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to jump kind of all over the sure. place. Um, as a, a younger person, because for some reason, when I look at my analytics on Instagram, um, it's, it's that age group from 19 to kind of 32 is my biggest kind of uh, followers. And so they're thirsty though. Yeah. They're thirsty for investing into real estate. Yeah. What I like actually, because I also s- have a staff that kind of is in that age group as sure. well. They don't really care about necessarily owning their own home. They, they, mm. they understand that maybe even owning where you live is not necessarily something that you need to do. Right. 100%. Like, you know, a lot of uber, uber wealthy people that don't necessarily own their prints like the, where they live is not the property that they own. They just make sure that they invest into real estate. Mm-hmm. But what are some easy ways that you would advise this, that that generation, that age group to get into investing into real estate? Well, I think there's a, a couple of fundamentals around it. You know, usually there's a challenge with cash. Right. And, you know, can we come up with that down payment and can we make things happen? But and when you go to get financing, you're getting financing on an investment piece of real estate Mm -hmm. makes it a little bit tougher. You know, can you get in? So, you know, depending on the scenario, for me, the most common recommendation I make, go buy a home and make sure you have a basement suite and rent it out and get some freaking roommates because you're young anyways and you don't need all the conveniences that you had from mom and dad's and you literally have yourself set up that your mortgage payment is being made by your roommates. You control it all and you live for free and you've got an investment property that you can do one of two things. You can at some point sell mm-hmm. in, the, in the future and or gain some equity and pull some equity off the table and reinvest or turn that into a property, move out and just leave it as a rental property. And for the kids, they call that you know now in 2023 house hacking, but we just call that smart investing. It is. It really is. We all did that, right? Like you buy a house and you you live upstairs and you rent downstairs. I think what most people should do, especially the younger generation, is just flip it. Live in the basement. Yep. Right? And just get rid of that mindset that you need to kind of keep up with the Joneses and Brampton. We say keep up with the things. But it's an interesting conversation, Jazz, because here's the thing, right? Is that that's the difference between, in my experience, that mindset is the difference between creating wealth early on and delaying it. And because you're living into a whole different, you know, yes, live in the fricking basement, rent it out, get that upstairs hacked out, you know, exactly rent it out. And that's what you create wealth. If you have to move from mom and dad's and expect that same lifestyle, that same level of home entering the conversation with, you know, all of the bells and whistles, well, that's going to set you back. It's going to slow you down. What do you think it is? Is it, is it just because they don't want to tell people that they live in a basement? Like, is that kind of the mindset? No, there's, sure, there's lots of ego around it, but I think it really is, you know, we know what social media is like. You're on social media. I'm on social media. You know, we're old enough and wise enough to know that those moments in time that are captured are just moments in time. You know, it's like the couple walking down the beach in the sunset. You know, it's like this perfect scenario. And little do they know that, you know, literally three seconds before that shot was snapped, that couple was fighting, you know, and <laughs> she was going to storm off, right? Laura, Laura always talks about it. If it didn't happen on Instagram, it never happened. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> you know, it's those, those hallmark <laughs> moments, right? So then what are you comparing yourself to? And the psychology of it is very uh, interesting. And I think we can all be at the effect of it beating ourselves up for what we're not enough of you know, what we haven't achieved because we're busy comparing ourselves. But when you really dig into it and being in the business that I'm in and been a coach for 25 years and you start to realize what's in behind all of those pictures, right? And it's hard though to convey that message, you know? There's a fundamental, There's it's interesting when it comes to all of that. There was a friend of mine, really wealthy guy and he was he's over at my house, but I've used this question a lot. This is what opened up the conversation one day. And uh, he wants to buy, he lives in the country and like I say, very accomplished. He wants to buy a excavator because he's renting one and 
Designs is going to buy one. And I says, well, how much for the excavator that you want to buy? And he goes, 150 grand. And I go, oh, okay. I go, you can rent a lot of excavator <laughs> for 150 grand. You know, what does it cost you to rent an excavator? Just a couple grand a week. Right. I go, gosh, you know, how many weeks do you need an excavator yeah. for, <laughs> right? And he goes, yeah, but he goes, you know, that everybody in the neighborhood's got one and they got a couple helicopters. Like we live in the country, right? <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, <laughs> right? so I'm going and he's comparing himself to this and I'm, and I'm joking. So I finally said to him, I said, here's a question I got for you. And he goes, what? He goes, I go, if nobody knew you were going to own an excavator, would you buy an excavator? And he went, that's a good question. No. I go, so you don't need an excavator. Yeah. So that's, that's the question. You know, I ask myself that question now with stuff. Even, not even buying stuff, but doing stuff. Right. If nobody knew I was going to do it, would I do it? Do it. You know? So, you're gonna come so to many yeah. decisions yeah. are driven by ego, right? Or, it's a filter. Or, it out. It's, a filter. Sure. it's a quick filter, right? Um, we have to talk about what's happening in the economy and real estate right now. And I know you have a lot of thoughts around this. Mm -hmm. um, we've done... Um, I was on your podcast, but you've been on our, our brunch uh, live on YouTube that mm -hmm. myself and Simeon do together for REC Canada. Um, last, talk about kind of what you saw happen in the last couple of years, and then we'll kind of transition into where you think this is heading. Well, I think there's a, you know, it's such a big conversation because there's so many things and factors that we haven't dealt with. You know, it's easy to think that it's the same as, you know, any kind of slow down in an economy, but this has been a global event. You know, Bank of Canada, it, like all central banks, you know, all of a sudden money was flooding the market, interest rates came down. We could see a lot of things that happening, interesting within our own team and, and JG, you know, who and I, who's a big part of my team, my right hand guy in all of what we do. And he's in the room, so big shout yeah, out. Yeah, big, out, to big shout out to JG. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about what's going on in econom economically. I mean, he's a very accomplished investor, so he's we're always in it, right? We're always thinking about what's going on. And, you know, there was a lot of things that we could see when the lockdown happened, and which was there would be a lot of opportunities gets created within the chaos. What we couldn't tell was just how long would the bank continue to pump money into the system and the actual effect of that. That was hard to anticipate. Mm -hmm. And we'd never been in it before. You know, you could you could kind of extrapolate it and think it. And we called, you know, I, I think that at that time we were making a lot of calls economically that were very correct, although timing was off a little bit. Mm -hmm. But when we see what's happening and arguably the Bank of Canada now raising rates um, has started to slow things down. If I look into the future about it and we can get into some detail if you like, I don't see a recession happening on a national basis. Okay. Now I want to, I want to qualify that with a couple things. You know, you in the real estate industry, you know, you guys getting your asses handed to you with what's going on and the slowdown. Mm -hmm. Many realtors, right? It's like, what are you talking about? We're in a recession right now. That's some of the actual conversation. So it depends where you're at. Fifty percent less sales. Like, yeah. I mean, okay. So there you go. Numbers, yeah. Right. So if you're in it and your business has been affected by it then 100%, it feels like a recession. Mm -hmm. But economically, when you look at what's going on with GDP growth, technically we're not in a recession. And when we look at a national scale, Southern Ontario is going to feel a little bit more pain than most other provinces, and certainly more pain than what's happening in, let's say, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. And they'll see growth. And I don't think we'll see a true technical recession. So. Technical recession is when GDP growth goes into negative numbers. I think Southern Ontario, Ontario overall, may get to the, that below the mm -hmm. waterline mm -hmm. that would put them into a technical recession, but I don't see that for the rest of the country today. Having said that, I gotta qualify a couple things. We got geopolitical macro issues, like we've, I mean, that's the wild card in all of it. You know, what is, you know, what's Russia and Ukraine going to do? What's China and Taiwan going to do? How is India's relationship with relate or with uh, Russia going to impact? There's so many big macro West mm -hmm. East kind of conversations that we don't know that uh, kind of is a wild card. Mm -hmm. Now, where does the opportunity from your guys' perspective, yours personally, from Patrick, but then also Rain 
as 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 a whole where do you see some opportunity now within canada and i'm talking it could be edmonton it could be calgary yeah. it could be southern ontario where do you guys see some opportunity well jg likes to joke and call me mr alberta but having said well, that I, I'm, like i usually like you know take your side on things as well but I'm going to have to kind of sway towards JG because I always think that you're a little bit Mr. Alberta as well, but continue. Brother. So, so right. We hear Alberta, but you know, I, let's put it this way. When I look at what, what, what are you, what's an investor trying to do? Put their capital to work. Our job as an investor, make your money work harder for you than you work for your money. And when we look at what's happening economically, we got to take the emotion out of it. So, you know, there was a time that, you know, certainly in the past few years leading up to about 2019, pretty tough time in Alberta when you look at housing, right? Cash flow, yes. If you worked hard, uh, rents were a little bit soft. Cash flow is a little bit soft. There wasn't a lot of appreciation in real estate that you owned. If you were buying real estate in, let's say, 2012, 14, guess what? You, you know, you really had very little appreciation over that period of time. Mm -hmm. So that's not to say there was an opportunity there, but you didn't have the appreciation on the other side of that, you come into Ontario, you guys were, you know, you're kicking ass, right? You got huge growth, uh, some decent cash flow if you're paying attention to what you were doing. So the tide has turned. It's not in common. So, you know, I'm old enough to have been through probably five recessions. I'm old enough to know that historically, if you look at what's happening in Canada, there is always this kind of Ontario, Western provinces, Ontario, and it's a teeter-totter, right? And they never seem to be doing well at the same time. You know, one is doing mediocre, the other is doing great. Is there a reason for that? No, I, I don't know. I think that's just the way the economy goes. I don't know that I have an answer for okay. that particular okay. question. It's, you know, sometimes it's politics. Got it. You know, when we look at what's happening in Alberta, you know, up until now, they've been really driven by oil and gas, and that's changing but when you look at what is happening in the oil and gas industry and the fight against it, uh, you know, it's, they paid a price for that. You said almost uh, five recessions. Yeah. I want you to go into that head of yours, that beautiful, beautiful head of yours with all the facts and try to think back. What were some of the similarities, if any, mm -hmm. and what were the differences between those five recessions? Because for me personally, and I'm and my viewers and listeners and all, like I did this podcast for one reason and one reason only. It's for selfish reasons. I'm trying to siphon everyone's information yeah, and kind of yeah. take from there and, and, and run, from, run, run with it. And whoever listens with me, great. And whoever doesn't, that's okay. So these five that you would have went through, what were some of the similarities and what were some of the differences? So we don't have to hear <clears> it. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know if I can give you that information from that perspective. I can tell you this, that uh, what I've learned is that up until really the past couple, recessions like so many, it shut me down. Because what's happening, all you're reading is headlines about unemployment. All you're hearing is, you know, the bad news stuff that leaves you sitting on the sidelines waiting for something. Like, like this can't be good. You know, I'm not going to get into this. And also as a business owner, uh, in my retail business, I could feel the slowdown. You know, people had less disposable income and they weren't spending as much money. So what have I learned? I can say this, regardless of what we're going to hear, and we're going to start to hear some things around uh, unemployment, and I think that's a good conversation to have for your viewers, uh, is that isn't the time to sit on the sidelines. It is the time to pay attention and look for opportunities. And most of those opportunities for the more seasoned investors or for the educated investors will be solving problems. Elaborate from Well, there's a lot of people that are going to be having problems right away. They're already having it. And, you know, for your realtor audience is if you're a realtor that can solve problems, that's where opportunities get created. Because here's some of the problems that are starting to happen. People own real estate that they bought, let's say, on a pre-construction deal. They can't close on that deal. They haven't been able to assign it. They never intended on owning it. They were always going to assign it. Guess what? The music stopped. Those aren't investors, those are speculators, they're gambling, they're rolling the dice and they got caught. It's like playing musical chairs, the music stopped, you don't have a chair. Now, they have a problem. Can you solve that problem? You're going to have individuals at any given time that are getting transferred, they're going through a divert, divorce, there's been a death in the family, all of a sudden they find themselves, they have uh, they don't have a job, they can't cover the mortgage payment, oh my gosh, I'm caught with a house, I don't know what I'm going to do, my wife's left me, my husband, whatever the story is, there's yeah. always life happenings. And if you can look at that and go, 
I can solve that problem. I can bring an investor in here. Hey, Mr. Investor, come with me. Let's get creative around a strategy that can work. You know, some, if you put a basement suite in this, we get this deal. Guess what? We can make this cash flow. You start to create opportunities. Often what people are looking for, or they think that opportunities are going to land in their lap, yeah, you know? Right. And it's just not going to, well, they do happen if you, know, but you have to know if you can't recognize an opportunity and if you don't know what's possible, you'll never see the opportunity. You just won't. You know, we use a term that with many of our RAIN members and with RAIN member realtors where they're actually what we call deal engineers. Okay. And the deal engineers are the realtor's ability to walk in because they understand performance. They understand real estate. They understand the need of an end user client and they can go in with their investor client and say, here's an opportunity. Here's what you can do, right? What do you, what about this? What about that? And many times the investor themselves, if they've got that savvy, which many do, they go, this is what I'm looking for. Bring me this kind of a deal. How does a realtor, cause we're kind of on this topic, get the education on, on becoming better deal engineers, right? So like they're, they're novice, they're, they, they kind of understand why they should become more investor savvy. They get it. They maybe see myself and the other, you know, couple of handful of people that are doing it at the level that we're doing it in our city. But how do they go actually get that information? How do they educate themselves? Well, you know, it's interesting and you know the stats better than I do, is that how few realtors are actually investors themselves? I'm going to say maybe 5%. Yeah. I'll give you maybe 10, but no, I'm going to no. 5%. Yeah, maybe. 5%. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 for sure. And, and here's the fundamental is that, you know, JG and I have had these conversations with realtors many times over the years, which is, you know, I was so busy making my clients rich. Yeah. It, it never occurred to me that I should do the same. And so first off is a shift of what your group, what this group is doing right today. They're sitting with somebody like yourself. They're listening to this kind of a conversation. Oh, they're only here for you, not for me. But I'm telling you right now. If I just told them I'm doing a podcast with somebody and they're all shaking, they wouldn't even come. It's because of you. So. The fundamental difference between a realtor that is investor focused is they understand relational, tra relational relationship versus transactions. And when you get with an investor and you work with a qualified investor and you start to help them succeed in that space, all of a sudden you're working with an individual who might do three, five, seven, 15 deals. And I'll give you an example. Uh, JG in this upcoming weekend, we're doing an event called Think Tank and we've got a group of quite sophisticated investors that are coming together and, and it's just a think tank. It's get together and we're gonna facilitate an amazing conversation, do all those things. That aside, we're doing some pre-conversations. You know, Both him and I have had conversations with investors. I had one this morning, 17 doors. Another investor, 24 doors. And I know JG's had a conversation with others. So one person, 17 doors. You know, so how hard does a realtor have to work to get 17 transactions? And so when you start to understand the investor mindset and you can align with that, you start to see, okay, relational. I can create a relationship. All he wants me to do or she wants me to do is bring me these kinds of deals. Oh shit! I'll go look for those kinds of deals, I and call I'll it bring the best them. drug in the world. Once they get addicted to it, the investors they want to do it over and over and over exactly. again, right? Exactly. But that's a mindset on the realtor's point. Yes. Right. It's like you don't care what investors don't care what the sink looks like or the cupboards look like. Depending on, they're going to probably knock it all down, <laughs> rebuild it anyways. So it's a different way of it. It's just math. You're taking the emotion out of it and go, okay, based on the economic fundamentals, based on the math, based on the tenant profile you want, this is going to be an awesome deal. You know, you, you use the term uh, deal engineers, and I'm going to probably steal that from you guys anyways a little bit, and I'm going to make use Please of do. it. Um, I love it. One thing that we're actually going to be practicing more in, in 2023 within our investor community at REC Canada is actually putting joint ventures together. Because we have people who have sixty, seventy thousand dollars in capital, and they're, they they want to do something here in their own backyard, but... Unfortunately, 60, 70,000 as a down payment just can't get you that far, specifically in the greater Toronto area. And so but then we have someone else that has that 60, 70,000. We can start to put more joint ventures together. What are the like the three, four things that somebody needs to know as an investor before they get into a joint venture? Oh, man, that's a that there isn't. There isn't three or four, three, three or four things is not even a warm up, you know? You. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think there's, you know, first and foremost, there has to be the education side of the equation. So, 
you know, because within the real estate, we think all realtors should be part of the rain community. We see the demand for realtors mm -hmm. within our own community. Like we're a national organization with investors across the country. And one of the things they struggle with is finding investor focused realtors. There's lots of realtors out there as we know, right? but there's not a lot of investor focused realtors. So that's one fundamental. And so the education part of it is really, really important. And when it comes to raising capital, even an investor focused realtor can start to say, oh, I can bring these two together maybe. So that's a, another, that's a deal engineer. Okay. Right. That's part of a deal engineer. But when it comes to understanding joint ventures and what you need to know if you're raising capital, first and foremost, you need to know your exit strategy. You cannot be going in for just the money because you've got a relationship with somebody. Uh, I'll take JG's joke here is that you're getting in, you know, you're, you're having a joint venture partner and statistically you're probably going to be with your joint venture partner longer than you will in a marriage. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like yeah. people go through divorces, you know, so well, it's like Simeon. Right. I mean, he's my business partner, but he's the second wife I never needed. Yeah, you know exactly. I mean? yeah for sure. For sure. Big shout out to Simeon. So that's, I know, you know he's watching and listening. And then, and then people, you know, like if I see the most, one of the most common mistakes made. So first off, they don't plan the exit. Number two, they chase the money rather than understanding that behind the money is a relationship that has to be, you know, you have to align. What do you bring to the table? What are you bringing to the table? You know, the last thing you need is, you know, two people that want to have a joint venture, but neither of them have money or both of them have money and neither of them know how to do a deal. So, yeah. you you know, what are you bringing to the table? The extra strategy part of it and then getting it in writing in a way that makes sense. We see that one often with friends. Um, you know, and I have to joke, I go, if I'm doing a joint venture with my mother, I want to paper that deal. It's not because they don't trust my mom, yeah. right? But, you know, things go wrong in life, you know? And if I got hit by the bus, the proverbial bus, you know, my mom needs to know that, okay, this is my deal, you know, and here's the paperwork and here's the titles and all the rest of it. And so you can be protected. You need to be protected. So that's, that's on that side of it. And of course, you know, partnerships go south. And uh, in any scenario, life happens on a, at a joint venture level. So for example, I'll give you a quick example, which is simply, you know, you've got a joint venture agreement with a couple, they're the they're money partners and something in their life changes. I need to get my money off the table. Well, hold it. We knew this was gonna be a five year deal. I get it, I gotta get out. Now you, I need my money. You personally as an investor, Patrick, are you, are you more like a buy and hold guy? Like what's your kind of- Always been buy and hold. Okay. Oh, that was my only strategy. Um, you know, the, because I ran the business, you know, my passion isn't real estate. My passion is business and I love doing business. I love coaching. I love supporting people's success. So my portfolio was to augment, to be a, a part of my overall, you know, we'll call it retirement plan, if you will. It was really designed in that way, not to be a business that I drove every day. So I have had partners in the past and, and they were very operational and we built great portfolios. And, you know, that was kind of how but I was never, and I shouldn't say never. I spent a lot of time in the trenches early on. Mm -hmm. And I went, nah, it's not, doesn't interest me. When you say trenches, you mean like going in and doing like Doing deals, you know, exactly, exactly, and all that kind of stuff. exactly. Like that. Early on, I did all that stuff. And now? Managed my own properties, did all that. You no longer do the managing of the properties? No. You kind of just delegate No, I got one, one kind of real, ex, you know, kind of executive loft that, that I handle my own. Is that more because it's a pack, like a little bit well, of a Well, it's, it's a cool deal okay. and it's an interesting property. It's 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 a building that's 110 years old or something like that. You know, it's- Alberta? In Alberta, yeah. Okay. And it's a really cool property. So he is Mr. Alberta, JG. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you don't have to, you don't have to, you know, humor him. Like, <laughs> um, I don't need um, you guys. Southern Ontario. What do you like about it from an investment perspective? You know, you've got the one fundamental thing that the other provinces, well, I shouldn't say other, other than BC. Well, you got population growth. You know, you got industry, you've got jobs. And ultimately, that's what you need to see growth in real estate. Now, with Alberta, what's always concerned me is the, like the peaks and the valleys mm -hmm. in terms of appreciation yeah. right um like personally i didn't like what happened in ontario a couple of years ago that 20 percent mm, lift you know? lift yeah, right because sure. something goes up that fast it has to come down yeah. i just kind of want to get your thoughts on like did that scare you and if so how do you feel like when alberta kind of does that as well well it, we get frustrated like anybody else you know you're riding the wave and then all of a sudden it, you get the rug pulled out from under you it's interesting is that, you know, I learned some really 
expensive lessons in terms of investing in a town, for example, that isn't necessarily a one horse town, but it's a, it's driven by one economy. And in Alberta, you have those smaller centers. I'll use Grand Prairie as an example, because I had a lot of real estate in Grand Prairie and it was booming. It, you know, it's a city over 50,000 people, brand new hospital, multi, you know, like a, probably at the time, a $1.5 billion hospital went into it. Like it was, it was really a city that was building, but when oil got hit, it was like the city shut down. And you start to understand more the dynamics of population, but the dynamics and the diversity of an economy. And one of the things that has happened and why you're seeing growth in Alberta is there, Alberta has diversified. Mm -hmm. You know, the oil industry has changed a lot. So as much as we think about, we have to understand that the oil industry is, technology has taken over that Got it. world. And so, it's not even dependent on the, the same labor force that it was in the past. It's not just about the oil rigs. No, though. it's not. I mean, the technology they, in itself listen, probably offers a lot of it. jobs. You know, it used to be 15 guys on a rig four. Now it's three. And, it. you know, and they, they're probably in a downtown office of Calgary doing it remotely. It's like that. It's, it's gotten that, that sophisticated. So it's, it's a different. And, and they've diversified the economy um, a lot. And that's why you're seeing so many people flooding into that province right now. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'm going to. If you had to choose between Edmonton and Calgary from a, a long-term growth, because I'm a buy and hold guy, so I'm kind of asking more for myself. I have $100,000 I want to invest, yeah. and I have to invest in one of the two. Where am I, where, where would you advise well, me? Well, there's a couple of things around that question, okay. right? The first of which is, what is your long-term goal? If you're a long-term buy and hold guy, you know, the first thing I'm saying, and I'll say this, and I know I'll get in trouble for it, but I'll say it anyways, do not buy a freaking condo I love this. in Calgary or Edmonton. Tell us Especially why. Especially Edmonton. Because we're Toronto guys. We're sitting <laughs> in my headquarters here in Toronto. We're, we're above condos. But I love that you always say, don't do it in Alberta. Don't do it. Go. Don't do it. Don't do it. You know, there's a fundamental, there's a, a number of things around that. You know, number one is in Edmonton, it is a, they built far too many. You know, when things were booming, every, they, they were actually taking apartment buildings, converting them into condos, you know, and, you know, that strategy back then was by, you know, it was the, the term was buy by the yard, sell by the inch. Okay. That was the term that yeah. was used back then. Well, it flooded the whole market with them. And then, and then the downturn, and the next thing you know, there's all these condos and there is no market for them. So, and then a lot of new build condos and the market turns down, nobody can sell. So what did those developers do? They started renting out. And so the fundamentals around condo is also, I'm going to use the term culture, but you're wide open prairies. You know, there's space is not a problem. You know, we don't ever have a conversation about, we don't have room. You know, right. they just, they're sprawling. Calgary and Edmonton are both sprawling cities. People they, don't think about in, in, in those areas like, oh, I would love to have a 600 square foot condo no. in downtown Edmonton. No. That's just not their mindset. Well, you know, think about it. You know, they're... We joke about it all the time. You can go into Grand Prairie, nobody would even look at a condo because in Grand Prairie, as an example, Oil City, you've got to know your client. What do they do? They make a lot of money. They then spend it on toys. Helicopters? And it's boats, bikes. I was going to say helicopters. <laughs> helicopters, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> boats, bikes, you know, snowmobiles. Got it. They need a place to put it. So, you know, 600 square feet, I mean... That isn't even enough for their garage, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, so yeah. that's it. So it's just a different mindset. It's a different way of being. And of course, cost-wise, you know, they can buy a lot of yard. They can buy a lot of house for, you know, that kind of dough. Going back to my question, though, and it's my fault because I cut you off a couple of times. Um, Edmonton or Calgary, long-term okay, so, growth. Yeah. I'm not doing a condo, so yep. that that's good. Yeah, you know, the, it's... If I was going in today, I would probably go into Calgary. Okay. But having said that, I, I can do that because I also know that it's interesting you ask this question. So here's a fundamental. Historically, Edmonton always follows Calgary about a year to a year and a half later. So you're starting to see growth in Calgary right now. I think, you know, 8% increase even in 2022. Like it was, and even to this day, growing. Slowing down a little bit, but growth. And Edmonton will, would traditionally traditionally follow that. Mm -hmm. But what's missing in that mix, and this is just a recent realization, you're hearing it here first, is I don't think Edmonton's going to this time. And the reason I don't think so is because Fort McMurray 
is not what Fort McMurray once was. And Fort McMurray was only a, a four and a half hour drive from Edmonton. And if you lived on the outskirts of Edmonton, on the kind of the northeast end, it was an easy, a relatively easy drive into Fort McMurray. But Fort McMurray isn't producing what it was before. It isn't, you know, again, with the, the oil sands, the technology's changed and the, the demand is different. And uh, Fort McMurray's got hammered a couple of times. You know, fire burnt the whole town down mm -hmm. almost. Not That's not true, but it, they really got hit. Then they got hit with a flood. And, you know, Suncor being one of the biggest in developers in that area, in the oil sands area, they've changed their dynamics as well. So that drove a lot of job growth and a lot of demand into Edmonton. So that's changed the dynamic of Edmonton as well. Grand Prairie, the same thing. So it's all to say this. I think Edmonton is still a long-term play, but it's not going to be what Calgary is. I mean, I hope my viewers and listeners understand why we like to talk about buy and hold a lot because what happens with values going up, interest rates going up, values then coming down, it doesn't affect you as much when you know that, okay, I'm going to hold on to this property for 15 years, 20 yeah. years. If not, I'm going to pass it. Like I, I'll probably hold on to this forever and yeah. just pass it on and yeah. have that generational wealth. Um, what's kind of your thoughts about that when you hear people saying, well, I'm really in it for the quick buck? Well, then you got to you, you got to have a different strategy. You know, that's it's always about the strategy. We will always use the comment, often say it, is this, there is no bad economy. There's just a wrong strategy within that economy. And so you have to change what it is that you're doing within an economy. You know, so for right now, when you start to see the challenges of getting financing, you've got immigrants coming in that can't get financing, number one, because they're immigrants. Uh, they don't have a credit rating, but they still want to have a home. And, you know, we start to see that lease to own, rent to own is a great opportunity in this particular marketplace. You know, uh, fix and flip, you better know what you're doing. Right. You know, ultimately. Uh, but these are little strategy tweaks that you have to do to get in, get out. You I know, lo I love that you said, like, when you're fixing and flipping, you better know what you're doing. Because I have friends who are like on those national TV shows and that shit doesn't happen in 22 minutes like they show on TV. <laughs> Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, they're good friends of mine. Some JG of pulls it off. JG pulls it off. Oh, yeah, you know, but he's JG. He's special. <laughs> he's special. Um, so you better know what you're doing yeah. with that. And you yeah. better have, like, there's just so much around the fixing and flipping, yeah. right? Like, understanding that the contractors are not going to do what they said at the time that they said they're going to do, making sure that you have a slush fund and all that. And what you guys teach at Rain is a lot of these different strategies you put yeah. people together. How did you get connected with Rain? Because when I first heard of it, I've been licensed for 19 years, so 2004. It was originally, I believe, Don Campbell. Don or Campbell, yeah. At that time, yeah, probably, I think I'm bang on right around yeah. 04, 05. Yeah. Um, how did you get involved with that? And then I really want to talk about and give you kind of the mic and talk about all things kind of Rain. So hold that thought for one yeah, second. Sure. And I want to just finish on one thing about Alberta in case we don't circle back understanding that particular market. And when I say don't buy condos, the reason I'm stressing that right now is because what's happening, and we see this as a common mistake of investors slash speculators, is they're looking at Calgary and they can go, I can buy a condo for 400,000, for 250,000. Like that's cheap. And money is actually flooding into Calgary. And I think that there's going to be some pain down the road if people don't understand. If you're gonna get into that condo market, you better be with a realtor that knows what the hell they're doing. They know that city really, really well. And then you better hope that you can get out in three to five years. If you hang on longer than that, it's gonna eat your lunch. I'm glad you mentioned that because there is billboards all over the city of Toronto yeah. selling condos for Calgary. Yep. Like a selling Calgary condos and stuff. So I'm glad that you mentioned that because whoever's watching or listening, yeah. there is that one person who's probably thinking about investing. Yeah. They better know they, well, what they're doing or at least doing it with somebody who knows what they're doing. Yeah. I, you know, and I know some, we have great realtor partners in Calgary. I trust them because they know what they're doing. Yeah. So if they're selling a condo to somebody from Toronto, they're already having the conversation with that person about, okay, this is what you're going to do and you need to be out in this time frame. And there's all sorts of little things that you have to understand. Like I say, culturally, you have to understand that the mindset of people is not to why would I rent a condo? And not that they don't. Why would I rent it when I can rent a house and be yeah. on the main floor and do all this? So there's comparisons that we get drawn. But as an investor, you have to consider that we know that in Alberta, strata fees go only ever, ever go up. And they go up sometimes dramatically. We are at the effect of the insurance industry. And if you want to go back and a little bit of history of Alberta, and you start to realize that some of those condo boards had to literally increase their strata fees 
double, like double the strata fees to cover the shortfall of the cost of insurance that shifted in Alberta. And why did it shift in Alberta? Well, it shifted because of everything from the flood and the fire in Fort McMurray to the hailstorms in Calgary to the other floods in other parts of southern uh, Calgary and in Calgary. So Alberta got hammered weather-wise a number of times over a few years. Well, the, the insurance industry is going, we're not taking the risk. We're not going to mitigate. we got to mitigate that risk. And they do that by, of course, increasing insurance costs. Which just cuts into your cash flow. It's and, completely and, different. And the next thing you know, your fees, your strata fees are doubling. So, right. you know. And just for everybody who's listening, if you're in Ontario, when Patrick says strata fees, that's just maintenance fees, condo. Yes, exactly. And that's the term they use in the West. Um, I love the fact that you use the word culture because here in the GTA, the culture is different when it comes around condos, right? Um, Not to say that they're the best investments within real estate either. Um, Obviously, we do a lot of them and we help our clients, but I never want anyone to think that that is the best type of investment. I think it's a great investment for people who are starting out um, and obviously diversifying. But the culture here in the GTA is, well, bro, I do not want to shovel the snow. Yeah. I don't really care about cutting the grass. Yeah, totally. I don't care about all the extra space. We laugh all the time. You People have a 2,500 square foot home. They really felt it in COVID that they probably only use 700 square feet of it anyways. And yeah. the only time they maybe use the other part of the home is when they didn't like the sound of their partners blinking because we were so close with each other during that time, right? But aside from that, people love condos in the gta because we don't have to do the upkeep and the maintenance yeah the thing is is that when as investors what do we want to do we want to buy down a mortgage and we want to get some appreciation and the condo market historically in alberta is is you get a little bit of gains and then it goes flat and then it comes back so you have to look at it as an investor and saying well what do i want to get out of this yep and and it's just not the best use of capital in that market well again I'm, you know and i know i'm sounding like a broken record because i keep on saying i love what you said but the fact that you always want to know your exit strategy, obviously you mentioned it more with a joint venture partner, but look, I mean, matter. you're always kind of doing a joint venture partner with at least minimum the person in the mirror. You want yeah. to ask that person, hey, what am I going to plan to do with this? Because when shit does hit the fan, like we're kind of feeling right now with the cost of borrowing increasing so much, yep. if you're going to do it for the long term, you know you're going to end up winning. But now get two hosts on a couch together, mm. go off on a bunch of tangents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You more than me. Um, <laughs> of course. Uh, uh, <laughs> I want to go back to rain. Okay. Cause please. like you made a joke, you know, I asked you just while we were walking over here from, from the office, how many members and you're like, yeah, we got a couple of members. Um, and I know you were joking as well. I mean, you guys are by far the largest real mm. estate investment network. Obviously that's your name, but you guys yeah. are by far the biggest yeah. investment group in the country. I mean, just kudos to like yourself. And, and I know, and I know you enough, Patrick, I know you, you put it on your team. Like you got a, an amazing crew. I've been very blessed to, to deal with a lot of them. Mm-hmm. Um, how many members are you kind of at, like where you're at right now? I, it, I can't even on, answer that yeah. question. Honestly, I, what I can tell you is that over the course of the years, they've transacted $5.4 billion worth of real estate. That's with a B. There's been about 180,000 people through our programs over the years. Amazing. And, you know, at any given time, we've got probably 30,000 that we're communicating with. And again, as I said it earlier on, I think you guys and full transparency, I mean, I have no incentive by saying this. I don't get paid to say this. Um, I'm actually very close with other investment groups as well. But again, what you guys do best <clears throat> is your data and how you put it out there and how consistently you put out mm. data. So your your what I call kind of crack team, your research and development team, I mean, is is one of the best. And and like, how did you guys put all that together? Well, like, what's well, there's the- a there's a fundamental that we believe, right? Which is, and it's not to say it's right, but we don't sell real estate. Yes. That's okay. True. So we don't believe that we can provide great research and unbiased research if we have skin in the game, as in we've got a deal to sell. There's lots of those individuals out there, right? It's like, you know, join me, I'll show you how awesome this town is and how, you know, how to invest in real estate. And oh, by the way, I just happen to have the perfect model that you might want to take. And that, that, I'm not going to make that model wrong. People have had a lot of success with it. It just isn't what we do. And so our stand is that at this point has been that we're not going to sell a deal in the back end. So you come for the education, you come for the network, you can come for the access to trusted partners right across the board in terms of, you know, meeting people like yourself, meeting accountants, meeting lawyers, meeting uh, mortgage brokers. So really, it 
doesn't matter. It becomes this resource that you don't have to sweat it. You're dealing with proven, what we call trusted partners that are investors themselves. They're investor focused. That's what the network is about. That's what the community is about. It's a culture of collaboration. It's a culture of sharing. It's not about people holding their cards close. I'm not going to tell you what I did. No, don't do what I did or do what I did. Like this really works, you know? So that's really what the community is all about. The research, and we have a research team. I do a lot of research because it's just kind of how I'm built. I'm interested in it. I, I like it. I don't know why, but it's, you know, I like to try and see the future and analyze the data and figure shit out. And I'm very politically, you know, activated. Yeah. <laughs> I like that word. <laughs> so That's wanna, a new one. I haven't heard that. I want to push my buttons, talk yeah. politics, yeah. you know, because, you know, I just have a, a strong view of how our country's run. And, 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 and I'm really realizing, you know, at this point in my life, you know, just how small our country is but how big of an impact we could have in the world. So I get a little bit fired up when we're not doing that. <laughs> so, you know. Do you think the government made the wrong decision in terms of how long they kept us locked down? Well, a, okay, a, so Jazz, so Jazz. Yeah. You're a business guy. Yeah. You knew two weeks after they locked us down yeah. that it was too long. Bang on. So they overreacted. That's my opinion of it. Yeah. The banks overreacted, you know, uh, uh, Tiff Macklem should have been fired, Yeah. you know, given what he did in terms of interest rates. It's like, you didn't have to be a sophisticated anything, I don't believe, a little bit of business savvy. Many business guys were seeing it going, what the hell are they doing and yeah. why are they doing this? This makes no sense. They don't need to do this. They're overreacting. They're, you know, putting their putting too much liquidity into the market. This is going to lead to inflation. It's going to lead to problems. You know, like everybody, it seemed, could see it, mm -hmm. but the Bank of Canada and our federal government. Why? Well, that's, you know, that becomes, you know, if you listen to people who believe in conspiracy theory, then it would be a conspiracy theory. You know, that they did it because they want to shut this down or that down, and then the World Economic Forum comes to play. And I've got all those stories, by the way. I know them all. Yeah. And But ultimately, you know, there's, and I don't remember the exact quote. I wish I did. But, you know, don't accredit anything to conspiracy that can be really accredited to just stupidity and incompetence. <laughs> I like that. I do like that. Right? Because so there's some stupidity. Stupid decisions, yeah. in my opinion. It was just, and, and that is not even in hindsight. And JG would, would attest to how fired up I got about certain yeah. things. And, you know, the writing was so clear because it just was clear. And, you know, we saw the breakdown in supply chain. We saw inflation coming because of supply. As we sit here today, given Tiff Macklin, you know, commitment to bringing inflation down, you know, it's, it's, he's going to look, at some part he's going to look like a genius. And it's going to be because inflation will start to come down. Mm. And it's because supply chains are opening up finally and right. have opened up and things are starting to flow and goods are starting to come into the market. There'll be some deflationary things because all of those sea containers that were stuck now opened up. Now all that inventory is rolling in. And guess what? I don't need this inventory. They're going to blow it out. So we're going to see some stuff come down. But ultimately it's going to be, well, look what interest rates did. Well, interest rates had no impact on supply chain. Right now, oil prices are down as we have this conversation, but oil prices will go up again. We'll start to see that shift again. That's my own research, my own opinion, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and so ultimately, when I see the overreaction, it is now we're paying the price. You know, Tiff looked into the camera, whatever it was, and said, you know, interest rates are going to remain ago. low for a very long time. They're not going to go up until at least 2023 and, you know, release the hounds. And what happens is everybody went out, they bought, they drove the economy, they renovated, they bought boats, they invested in real estate, they did whatever they did, and they borrowed money to do it. And so you've got a large population of people that are over leveraged. And right now, that's kind of like getting a margin call, kind of. 100%. Yeah. Um, you've been actually, I didn't even have to, you know, look at JG in terms of you when you were getting revved up and amped up two years ago, a year and a half ago, a year ago, with what was happening in our economy, because you do a lot of content. Mm -hmm. 
when did you start shifting into actually like putting out a lot of videos? And then I want to talk about your podcast as well, which I think is like one of the best podcasts out there. Um, the team will make sure they put all the links and everything there. But when did you start to make the shift of like, okay, I'm just going to get in front of camera and start putting these videos up like on your LinkedIn. Like you, I think you're very, like, I think that's one of your favorite platforms. Well, I, I like, yeah, LinkedIn and Twitter. I mean, I okay. like LinkedIn better. It's okay. more mature. It's more civil yeah. <laughs> i don't know it's it's more intelligent to me it's okay. not just rants you know yeah, we all have our like <laughs> well like i can rant on, on linkedin yeah. too but twitter's a you know a good format for that but anyways i like linkedin i think you know when we did the pivot you know as a team we have an international team so when jg and one of the other executive bonnie when they came on board several years ago we had an international team so there's a couple aspects to get to your question so JG is an expert in marketing as well. He has a huge history in terms of his marketing and and we were just cutting our teeth on, you know, how to do a Facebook live, you know, mm. and we were all freaked out about it. And he's just like, dude, stand in front of the camera and talk. You know, it was like that, right? So that was several years ago. We had an international team. So Zoom was our normal kind of way of operation. Ah. So when, when COVID hit, we actually did an event in Calgary of March 7th. Uh, of 2020. Literally a week, I think. We Literally a week before, me. yes. Yeah, yeah. And so we had several hundred people there, although we did have some people cancel from Ontario that would normally have traveled to Calgary to be at that event. We still had a, you know several hundred people show up for that event. That was on the 7th, which was a Saturday, Sunday kind of thing, whatever it was. And then literally we flew home and we were locked down. The thing was that we literally turned the cameras on within a couple of weeks and we're doing events live. You were up because you already had the. the we already the knew what we were doing. Zoom. Yeah, we were already on Zoom. We were already doing it. And of course, like I say, we got an amazing team, and I give JG and Bonnie and that whole crowd a lot of credit because we were already doing that. Right. You know. So for us, it was already some version of normal. And yes, we had to up our game and get backgrounds and do all the things that we did. But we were teaching members how to be on Zoom, oh, yeah, and yeah. it was so it was great. So we we had a big crowd. We had a, a really. Uh, I guess a, a pretty cool audience given that nobody else had, you know, they're still trying to figure out how to spell zoom, oh, you know? Sure. Yeah. It was, so we were already and turn on the mic. You're on mute. <laughs> You're on mute. You're on mute. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's like the yeah. most said word in 2020. Yeah. yeah. Um, I got, I got voted with the team. I got voted with the team with the oh, one person were? that's always going to know who's going to, we have a little comp like with little awards that we give at the end of the year. And I'm, I'm the guy voted most likely to have his mic on mute. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, um, I digress. Your podcast. Yeah, podcast. How did that start? When did that start? And how did you come up with the name? You know, The Everyday Millionaire was really, um, you know, I'd had lots of people say, write a book, write a book, write a book. I'm just not inspired to write a book. Although, you know, JG has pointed, he's got a background in in publishing. And uh, I've released some reports and been really at the core of driving that authorship. And I, you know, and he's going dude, you just wrote a half a book. Why don't you just write the other half and then write a book? Anyway, that's a little bit of a side joke. But <laughs> the podcast was at the time was almost seven years ago. I think it was seven years ago this year. And it came to me in terms of people saying, suggesting I should write a book. I wanted to, it didn't really appeal to me. And uh, it literally was a, an idea on a beach in St. Lucia. And I said, I wanna, I'm going to launch a podcast. And while I was sitting on the beach, I came up with the name The Everyday Millionaire. And it was because there was a lot of podcasts that like to, and I get it, interview all of the billionaires and all of the, the who's names. who, the big names. But I'm surrounded by what I refer to as everyday millionaires. Just people who chugged away, did their thing, created amazing wealth, all have a cool story. Many do. And was more achievable. And when at the time when I did the research and the numbers have changed a little bit, less than 1% of the North American population, but we'll talk about Canada, less than 1% are actual net, have a net worth of a million dollars. Yet that's a common number that people want to achieve. Right. Now, if you live in certain circles, you go, what are you talking about? You know, but the reality is data shows that a true millionaire net worth less than 1% of the population. Now that number's changed. It's up around 4%, 5%. Okay. But it's still a very, very small number that achieved that status of millionaire. So I started interviewing guests called the everyday millionaire. Those individuals who 
were on a clear path, who had businesses, who had real estate, who were, you know, achieving amazing results. And that if they could do it, you could do it too. That was the whole concept. Seemingly right. ordinary people that were achieving extraordinary results. That's why you probably had me on it. Like, if this idiot can do it. Yes. Ex- exactly. That's what he said. If this guy can do it, you can <laughs> definitely do it. For me, my the one thing that really changed the course of my business and it really has changed the course of my life now is my podcast it's my i'm gonna say it's like my top in business and in like work stuff other than like personal family like wife kids and parents and all that um other than maybe the immersion program it's immersion and podcast that kind of go i go back and forth um it changed the course of my life like I I, i love it I I don't really have to, like it doesn't feel like work for me. Yeah. It's opened up so many doors. I mean, I'm sitting here with you. We're talking. I was like, oh, you brought JG with you. I'm like, JG, let's do a podcast too, man. Hundred oh, percent. Your story, you know. Um, yeah. um, um, some close friends. He's of mine. way more interesting than I am, by the way. I'm telling you. <laughs> we'll right see now. about that. You know, what? we're gonna let the viewers decide that. <laughs> we'll one. let the viewers decide. Yeah, yes, out of on that one. <laughs> um, for you though, Patrick, what has the podcast done for your business and, and, and maybe your life, I don't know, you don't have to take it that far, but like, what has it done for you professionally? Not yeah, I don't, business. I couldn't say what it's done for the business. I think yeah. it's, it's always interesting. The listeners that will follow up and go, I listened to your podcast and it's awesome. And I've learned so much. And so that's always really encouraging. I mean, otherwise you're just speaking into a microphone <laughs> yeah, yeah. hoping it like hell, somebody's like, yeah. somebody <laughs> listening to this yeah. conversation. Yeah. Um, but I think for me professionally, in terms of my own development, you know, we I joke about, you know, JG giving me a hard time, say, just look into the camera and freaking talk, dude. Like, quit worrying about it. And and that was really hard to do. And but I, what I realized is, number one, I'm a tough study. Okay. <laughs> but number two is he was right. Yeah. And so you know, at the end of the day, now it's just a normal way of being, and we couldn't do it any other way. It really, if you're passionate about the message that you have, if you really believe in what you're doing and that you do, in fact, have something to share with people that's of value, it is the absolute way you have to do it. And it's effective and it works. What I've noticed with the podcast and especially the past couple of years and especially this past year, and I guess it's just time spent, you know, we, you know, thousands of listeners, tens of thousands of listeners and I'm being approached on a regular basis by some really cool people, you know, right. that like I've, I've got a couple of guests that are sitting in the, in the hopper that I'm really excited about interviewing See them. See how cool that yeah, is, that's, right? Like that's it just cool. opens up yeah, yeah. so many doors, yeah. right? Yeah. That I think people don't, don't realize that, that just by putting yourself out there a little bit and it's tough, I'm sure as you mentioned, like, you know, if you didn't have someone like a JG and maybe your team saying like, you really got to do this, maybe you wouldn't have done it as quickly or whatever. Um, but I have a feeling, how many episodes are you at now for yours? Off the top of your head, like, oh, you the hundreds uh, now? Obviously, you're seven years ago. Well, seven years ago, but I every two weeks. But then yeah. my wife and I do another podcast called Mindset Matters. Right. So my wife, Stephanie, is an Olympic mental performance coach. So we do a segment every week. Little 30 30 minute segments called Mindset Matters. And we just talk about mindset. And, you know, uh, she works with world class and Olympic class athletes, but we have always translated that into business. Well, our. My, my business partner in the media company, Laura Stewart, just started the Laura show. Um, and she won't have me on. She won't have you on RJG because she only has females on. Oh. Um, so I, I got, think, I can I line Stephanie, you up with some freaking all stars. Okay. So like <laughs> like big, like really cool. She, like it's cool. all about the stories of, of, yeah. of, of women and just kind of go oh. through their whole thing. I've got three right off the top of my head that would love to be on your show and you would love them. And the next thing you know, they're going to be best friends. Okay, perfect. <laughs> there um, you go. That's awesome. <laughs> um, we'll make that connection and all that. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, what, what I was saying was I'm actually trying to speak very loudly on why investors, mm. not only business people, real estate agents, mm. CEOs, but why investors should be putting out content and yeah. specifically a podcast, because I think it's a great way to let other potential maybe joint venture partners get to know that investor, sit down and learn more. Like, I, I personally think the investing community is one of the, the most positive communities out there. I go to like business meetups and I always find people are holding stuff close to their chest. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to tell Jazz my secret yeah. because then he's going to steal it. Where investors, like you said earlier, 
are are like don't don't do this strategy because I hit my head against the wall. Or make sure you use my mortgage broker, Chris. He's awesome, right? Like there's all these people who are sharing yeah. in the, in that environment, but there's just not a lot of people who are putting out content from an investor's perspective. Yeah, right. Like yeah, are you and finding that that's just that there might be some opportunity in white space there? Yeah. Well, I think there's. I'm not clear on your question, Jess. So you know, let me go back to content. Yeah, you know, so to establish your, you know, so writing a book being an author, the whole concept of that at its core is if you are an author, you are an authority. Mm. Okay. The word author comes from authority. So when you become an, auth an authority and you write the book, guess what you've done? You've provided content and you've established yourself as the authority in that space. So, you know, there's a lot of competition in that space that may turn off people from doing content. You know, I can't do what they do. They're doing that. It just doesn't really, doesn't really appeal to me. You have to push yourself through that edge. And, you know, you're one of those guys that doesn't need to be scripted. You just riff shit off, you know, and you I do know it. that I had, I, 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 like, you didn't know that I did have a script. On <laughs> yeah, my you board. got a script, <laughs> you know, but you're, you're, you, you may script some stuff, but most of your stuff is not scripted, right? Yeah. You just know what you, you've got flow, you've got things going. I'm not good at monologues. As a matter of fact, Stephanie was not here to do a mindset matters segment with me, which means I have to do a monologue. And I hate it. Like I just like I'm just not good at it. Yeah. You know, my brain doesn't fire that fast. So I need somebody to you know let me catch my breath, give me a thought, and yeah. so and that's you know that, that bantering. Back that's bantering front. back. Yeah. That works really well for me. I yeah. can do this all day long, yeah. and I think I can do it quite well if I stay focused on some stuff. But ultimately, you know, for realtors that are trying to establish themselves, they have to put that content out. They have to get uncomfortable, and it only takes practice. You know, there's a fundamental thing around that we've learned with you know with. I use the analogy all the time with athletes. You know, when you see a world-class athlete, you have to go into the background and go, how many times did they fall down? Thousands of times that they fall down in practice. Thousands of times that they show up at a competition that they lose. You have to go through that learning curve. You're not going to look into a camera and hit it out of the park the first time. You're just not. You got to do it, and it just is in that. You are the business of you. As a realtor, consider yourself the business of you. Even if you're in a brokerage, all the rest of it, you are the business of you, and you start to establish that part of you, and you look into the camera, and all of a sudden, you start to show up, and people get to resonate with you. Two guys sitting here right now, we're having this conversation, and if we are both realtors, somebody's going to be attracted to you, yep. somebody's going to be attracted to me. Nothing to do with what we said. It's just the energy, how we show up, the values that we have. They may interview us both and pick one or the other. But the point is, you're always going to attract like-minded individuals. So back to the RAIN community, we're very clear on our ethos. And part of our ethos is that, you know, four dimensions of trust, the energy that we bring to any relationship that we have, you know, the heart that we put into it because we give a shit, we really care. And, you know, we, and, and about sharing. So that is, we took ethos because I'm, that's how my brain fires. Yeah, 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 I yeah. turned it into an yeah. acronym, but that's really what it is all about. So when you create that ethos, then the community aligns with that. And so that's how the whole community has a tendency to show up. And that's what is attracted is because that's how I operate. That's how I think. That's how I show up naturally. It's just how I'm wired. It's why JG and I can be friends. It's why Bonnie can be part of this conversation. It's why we have the executive team that we have. Mm -hmm. And then that all just flows out into the values that you share and that people align with. Somebody's watching this and listening to this right now. And what would be the best way for them to connect with you personally, as well as connect with the network? Well, going to raincanada.com, always. Uh, easiest place. Easiest place to get on the website. Anybody, I, I, it's a public, you know, I share it all the time. CEO at raincanada.com. So CEO at reincanada.com is an email that always comes to me. And oh, thank I you. put it out there all the time. And, and when they go on the, the, the RAIN website, is that the place where they can just get more information in terms of how? Yep, the they, about our membership, about what we do, about how we do it, uh, where there's a learning, you know, where, where they can, in, what, what level do they want to embrace in terms of learning? Yeah. So we just produced, released, re-released a 
what we call real estate investing in Canada. It is a video program, education program that teaches the 15 steps. Absolutely world class. And, you know, if you want to just enter a conversation about understanding investing in real estate, these 15 steps, uh, literally a world class program. I don't even how many hours. I think it's like 70 hours of wow. learning in that. But it's, it's uh, myself and JG are delivering it. Uh, we're looking into the camera and delivering it. There's handouts and downloads and all sorts of stuff. It's a, well, I, like I said, I've been not, not only have I been part of some of your guys' banter with mm-hmm. each other, um, but I've seen a lot of stuff. And I'm telling everybody, all my whole community, go to Rain. They've made it like how you've made it super super affordable. Like, yeah. I don't know how you guys figured that out. You guys yeah. have. It's not expensive whatsoever for the amount of knowledge i mean that you're going to be able to to get but also the con- possible connections that yeah. you're going to be able to make yeah patrick i said it at the start brother um i am so thankful for you to have stopped by today yeah, it's fun. like you, you you we didn't do the virtual thing not that there was anything going to be wrong with it but we really got to do this virtually. i wanted to be in this cool studio so i appreciate yeah, it's that, all man. about it man. yeah like we just put this thing together about a a little less than a year ago and so yeah. it's all Look coming together Look and so that. um thank you for gracing the couch um and thank you for all the knowledge you put out there and just like how free you are with the information um and 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 again i'm lucky to call you a friend mm-hmm. um i appreciate your time and thank you for being here today brother thanks man loved it